Well, actually, there have been uh, three uh, major negotiations uh, in Ukraine uh, that should be mentioned. The first one goes back to 1990, uh, just before the Soviet Union itself uh, disbanded. The first negotiation was between Gorbachev uh, and uh, President Bush on uh, the end of the Cold War. And Gorbachev uh, said, we will disband our military alliance, the so-called Warsaw Pact. And the United States said, we will not take advantage of that. You allow Germany to be unified, reunified, and we will not take advantage of that. And specifically, the famous pledge was NATO will not move one inch eastward. Yes. And this pledge was made solemnly and repeatedly. There's a wonderful archive of materials demonstrating this uh, put together by George Washington University, the National uh, Security Archive Project. Uh, and uh, it shows that this is the way that the Cold War ended through negotiation. As soon as the Soviet Union dissolved, in December 1991, the U.S. reneged. But Russia was the successor state, uh, even in law called the continuation state. Uh, what was said to the Soviet Union needed to apply to Russia. But as soon as the Soviet Union dissolved, the American strategists in the Defense Department uh, in 1992 under Cheney and Wolfowitz uh, and Rumsfeld started the plan for a unipolar US-led world, or sometimes called hegemony, or sometimes called full spectrum dominance. And the idea there was yeah. that NATO would enlarge at will. That's the first negotiation. Second negotiation yeah. I would mention was in, 20, in 2008, the US, which had already uh, pursued NATO enlargement repeatedly against promises. Already NATO had expanded uh, to uh, 10 more countries, actually, uh, to uh, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Uh, by 2008, uh, the U.S. said, now we go to Ukraine. And the Russians said, no, you don't. That's our border. No, you don't. And the U.S. said, yes, we do. And uh, the Europeans were kind of aghast. Uh, but uh, George W. Bush Jr. pushed it through the 2008 NATO Bucharest summit. Fast forward uh, two years, Ukraine elected a president, Viktor Yanukovych, who said neutrality. We don't want to be uh, one side or the other because we're literally geographically in between west and east we're in the middle between russia and nato we don't want to be crushed so he said neutrality please the u.s could not accept neutrality they participated in the violent overthrow of yanukovych in february 2014. second negotiation which was uh, violence broke out after the coup the coup itself was violent, but then a, a war in the Donbass broke uh, out when the Russian ethnic provinces said, we don't want to be under a Western Ukrainian extreme nationalist group that took power by a violent coup. We want autonomy. What happened was a second negotiation called the Minsk Agreement. There was a short-lived Minsk I agreement, and then it was followed by the Minsk II agreement, which was endorsed by the UN Security Council. This was diplomacy. France and Germany said, we will be guarantors of the Minsk agreement under something called the Normandy framework. You know what the United States said? Told the Ukrainians, nah, you don't have to do that. We're, we got your back. We're going to arm you. You don't need to give autonomy to the Donbass. You don't have to really... Uh, apply the uh, to, even though all these countries have said yes and Merkel, uh, Chancellor Merkel said actually in a shocking interview very cynical a couple of years ago yes we knew it was just a, 
it, it was just biding time. We didn't really mean it. Okay, that was the second. <clears throat> in December uh, 2021, uh, just before uh, Russia invaded in what it calls the special military operation, President Putin put on the table a draft security agreement between the U.S. and Russia. I called the White House to urge the U.S. government negotiate on this. Not every word is right, but the basic idea that Ukraine will be neutral is to our advantage, Ukraine's advantage, and right there in front of us for the whole world to adopt and back. I was told, no, Jeff, no, we're not going to give Ukraine's right to join NATO. I said, you're going to go to war. Why do you want to have a war? No, we're not going to have a war. We're going to have diplomacy. I do not, uh, I do not admire these people because I don't think their judgment is, is sound. What happened, the war started. One month into the war, Robert, Ukraine said, okay, okay, we can be neutral. Zelensky said it within days of the February 24th invasion. We can be neutral. The Turks said, we'll mediate. And in Ankara, negotiations began. They right. moved fast forward very rapidly. I went to Ankara, actually, to speak to the Turkish negotiators. This was moving towards an agreement. The United States and UK intervened, told the Ukrainians, fight on. You don't have to compromise. You don't have to accept no NATO membership. Fight on. We've got your back. That was about 500,000 deaths ago in Ukraine. Right. I, I had a meeting uh, in the Vatican in the spring of uh, 2022. Uh, we brought in a lot of diplomats and, uh, uh, and uh, talked about the case for peace and uh, had huge opposition, by the way, uh, from uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian representative, the Ukrainian ambassador to the Vatican and so forth. It, it wasn't an official Vatican meeting. It was hosting a brainstorming on yes. negotiation. Well, the U.S. government objected. The Ukrainian government objected. They didn't want negotiations. They were going to win the war. They were going to defeat Russia. Those of us who know something about Russia said, I don't think so. Uh, you're, this is for Russia, existential. This NATO issue, they're not going to just say, oh, okay, go ahead, put in your military bases. They're not going to say that. It's going to, if things went badly for Russia, would escalate to nuclear war. Absolutely. Yeah. So well, this, is, this is my point. We've had a negotiation possibility for more than 30 years. So you asked me, what would it take now? One phone call from President Biden to President Putin that says, you know what, Vladimir, you're right. We're not going to expand NATO. You got to stop the war. You got to get out. We got to end this thing. We're not going to expand NATO. That was a terrible idea. Then what would ensue is some nitty gritty negotiations. What would the boundaries be? What would the land be? What happens to Crimea? What happens to the Donbass and so forth after these years of war? But peace would come because the motivating factor of this war has been the attempt to expand NATO. To this moment, it remains the declared objective of the United States, and it remains the declared utter red line of Russia so you have two nuclear superpowers with diametrically opposed ideas, and that is why the world is so fundamentally dangerous. Well, it was uh, good to hear that summary of the three attempts to make a negotiation all the way back to the fall of the Soviet Union. That was a time when you yourself were visiting Moscow and you were working with the leadership in the Kremlin. It's why it's interesting to talk with you because you've had that experience. Then the two, 2008 and then later beyond 2014 attempts to negotiate in some form or another the uh, 
relationship of Ukraine to NATO and relationship to Russia. And then finally, the third time in the spring of 2022, when you, I didn't realize you had actually flown to Ankara and sort of been on the edges of that negotiation. Yeah, just, just to be clear about that, I came just after they ended because I wanted to know why did they end? So I got a complete briefing from the, the Turkish uh, negotiators. It yeah. was very disheartening. Okay. And so we've gotten two years of war. The feelings of everyone are terribly uh, bloodied by the sense of thousands, hundreds of thousands of deaths. There's the idea of not giving up a single inch of Ukrainian territory. And the Russians are looking at it past the Ukrainians toward the Americans and the other supporters of Ukraine. So uh, you haven't really uh, suggested that there is a real possibility, except for a phone call from Biden, of yeah. any kind of a peace process being launched. So when you hear Pope Francis, or when Pope Francis asks his cardinal, Matteo Zuppi, who's the Archbishop of Bologna, is a member of the Sant'Egidio community, and he's traveled on behalf of the Pope to Moscow, to Washington, to Kiev, even to Beijing. Uh, do you think this Vatican effort is a helpful one? Does there seem to you any possibility that a non-aligned church party like the Vatican or like Pope Francis could play any useful role? Of course. First, uh, the, the, uh, the church has a basic proposition uh, that uh, peace is uh, the common good and that the way to peace uh, is through ethics of statecraft and through direct encounter. So the ethics of statecraft is the text of Pachem in Terrace uh, in 1963. Yes. Uh, and uh, Pope uh, John XXIII issued right. this marvelous encyclical after the Cuban Missile Crisis that became a major spur to the partial nuclear test ban treaty reached between the US and the Soviet Union in the summer of 1963. Then I would say in pairing with Pacham and Terrace uh, is Fratelli Tutti, because Fratelli Tutti, uh, Pope Francis's uh, major encyclical is about encounter. And it starts with the story of, uh, of uh, Francis of Assisi meeting the Sultan uh, on the battlefield of the uh, of the Fifth Crusade in Egypt, a most unbelievable but true story of, yes. seven, of uh, eight, 800 years ago uh, yes. that is absolutely the Pope's pastoral message because Fratelli Tutti is really a pastoral message. It says if you want to reach an agreement with someone, meet them, have a dialogue with them, treat them okay. on a human level. This is what I want between Putin and Biden, not this grandstanding. Uh, how can it be that from February 22nd, 2022 until today, 500,000 or so Ukrainians dead by now, there hasn't been one direct talk between Biden and Putin. That's unacceptable. Right. They need to meet. They need to talk. So this is now... Now, it, let me just mention two other points. For Russia, the core of this issue is NATO. And what Putin has wanted to hear going back to uh, 25 years now is that NATO enlargement will stop. It's the one thing that NATO never will say until today. Even the uh, Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, these days, after all of these deaths, say Ukraine will be a member of NATO. As long as he says that, Ukraine is on the path of complete destruction. So this is, this is now one major point, which is you cannot end this war without the United States involved. I don't want to say Ukraine has no agency because what Ukraine needs to say 
publicly is we will be neutral, period. That was going to end the war in March 2022. But uh, the, he, Zelensky was talked out of it, which is well, completely tragic. We, we do have a tragedy here. It's like a bloody mess. And everyone wants to somehow come out a victor. <laughs> exactly. Meanwhile, the boys are being killed. They're, they're exactly. Everyone wants to be a victor. No one wants to just end the killing. Yeah. And, I and, and by the way, Robert, just a, an interesting point. I mean, horrible in my view. Uh, one of the uh, literal moments of stopping the 2022 negotiations was a visit by Boris Johnson to Kiev. Right. Boris Johnson was then the prime minister of the UK. Now, Boris Johnson just said recently, uh, we can't let Russia win. That would be the end of Western hegemony. Those are exactly the words he said. What does yeah. Western hegemony mean? Western hegemony means we won. You know, it's got to be victor. We are number one. It is like playing, you know, uh, uh, plant the flag or whatever, uh, uh, the king of the mountain uh, when, when you're eight yeah. years old. Uh, yeah. This is how they think, these people. They don't think about peace. They don't think about stopping wars. They think about their hegemony. Well, anyone that says that is way off track. Well, I do think there were all sorts of opportunities in this past 30 years, at the start of which you were a part of the process of bringing the, the ex-Soviet Union, Russia and the other countries into some type of world relationship with the, economically, with trade, et cetera. There was a possibility and a real reality of friendship uh, of the Bolshoi Ballet, et cetera, traveling. And that could have been built on and somehow bit by bit after 9-11 and uh, then forward to these recent wars, we've lost that opportunity. I think there's a historical judgment to be made that we lost a great opportunity in this period. Yep, I but, agree with you. But now, now we still have to say, if, if, if another 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 of Ukrainian boys and also Russian boys are going to the front and their arms are being shot off and their legs are shot off, can't this be stopped if you fast forward in your mind to what could be a potential solution? What uh, people would you invite and what type of solution might they possibly propose? We could call up a map also of Ukraine on the screen. Uh, yeah. So b basically, uh, what's terrible truth about all of this is that you see Ukraine, even the word means borderland uh, in uh, Slavic. Uh, uh, it means the border of Russia uh, and it's the border of the West. It's in between uh, NATO and Russia and it should be playing the role of a bridge. Uh, it should not be playing the role of a bulldozer one direction or another. That's why neutrality is at the core of the solution. And there are important historical precedents about neutrality. My favorite is actually going back to 1955 when Austria, which of course was a, a part of uh, Hitler's Reich uh, in World War II and was occupied by the Soviet army after World War II, said that it would become a neutral country not a NATO country. And on that basis, the Soviet Union picked up its troops and went home. And mm -hmm. that was a model. Uh, it should have been a model for ending the whole Cold War, but it well, remains a model until today. So the well, first point is Ukraine should be neutral. It should have security guarantees from the UN Security Council, uh, from uh, other uh, major countries, Germany and others, but it should be neutral. That means no U.S. bases. That means no U.S. missiles. That means no U.S. troops on the 2,300-kilometer border with Russia, which is what Russia is existentially afraid of. Second issue is Crimea, which we see right there on the map. <coughs> Crimea uh, has been the home of Russia's naval fleet 
since 1783. And the idea of the West, not quite since 1783, but since 1840, has been to deprive Russia of its Black Sea naval fleet. This was the reason why Britain and France declared war on Russia in 1853 in the Crimean War. Yes. It was the plan of Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1997 that if we can surround Russia in the Black Sea with NATO, that means Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia, ah, then uh, we have uh, uh, defeated Russia as a great power. It's the reason why you hear so much about Crimea now, retaking Crimea. This has been a fixation of Britain since 1840. So this is uh, wrong. Russia in uh, 2012 negotiated with neutral Ukraine that it would have a lease on its naval base to the year 2042. A lease. But then when the overthrow came, Russia took back Crimea saying, no, we're not going to let NATO push us out of the Black Sea. We know that's what they want, and we're not going to let it happen. Well, Crimea is not going to go back. Believe well, me, this is a, a bottom line. If there's a lot of reports. We are on the 1st of May, and uh, as we speak, and there's uh, Putin's uh, new uh, term of office begins May 7th. Zelensky actually finishes a term of office on May 20th. Yep. There's been reports that there are even some small battalions of Ukrainians who have actually deserted on the front lines as the pressure of the Russians is very strong and the Western powers still have not given to the Ukraine the or the other reasons have prevented them from giving air support. There's reports that this entire front may collapse and that the Russians could go forward all the way to the river there in the middle of the map. The Dnipro, yep. Uh, and starting up with Kharkiv, which is the city at the top. It's not listed on this map, but it's just there in the top center. Uh, if that would happen, this would expand the war, we might say. It would uh, raise the stakes. And uh, if we were to look at just this particular stage, couldn't there be an opportunity here on the basis of this map to draw up some type of agreement? Absolutely. Today. The war could end. Ukraine neutral, and if uh, even on these uh, on the current contact line, uh, the Russians claim uh, four uh, regions. Uh, they claim uh, um, not only the two Donbas regions, Donetsk and Lugansk, but also uh, Zaporizhia region and Kherson region, uh, which are to the southwest. Uh, they don't have full control over all of them. My own view is that on the basis of Ukrainian neutrality, uh, you could uh, set the territorial issues probably along the contact line right now. But that's part of what negotiation would be about, All right. uh, those details. But I think your point is completely right, Robert. The longer this goes on, and with the U.S. claiming just claiming still today, NATO enlargement, NATO enlargement, NATO enlargement, uh, Russia will continue westward and it will take large swaths of territory that it will not give back under these circumstances. So this is not uh, in Ukraine's favor. Now, what uh, Ukraine says, no, no, arm us more, air cover, no fly zones, uh, U.S. Uh, Western troops and so forth. Okay, there is a path to World War III also, but there is no path to defeating Russia. That's the point. This has been clear from the first day, by the way. But people don't want to talk honestly about these things. They, The Western side, mainly the U.S. side, has believed that it could bluff or torment Russia into defeat through sanctions, through HIMARS, uh, through attack of missiles, through uh, under, other wonder weapons. It, it, very, very naive ideas 
uh, I, in the West. If you were going to advise Pope Francis, would you tell him to invite certain people to come for a weekend down to the Vatican, maybe there to the Academy of Sciences, and to talk through three or four points? Would you advise that, and which people would you invite? Well, look, I, I think that the, the, the basic point is uh, when Pope Francis says uh, Ukraine should have the bravery to negotiate, he's, he's making a very, very powerful statement. And it was very widely heard and very widely resented, I would say, by the hardliners. Uh, because uh, the hardline idea is, no, no, there can't be negotiations. But the Pope exposes the fallacy of that very effectively. I think the Vatican should say we are always ready to host negotiations. We are not a party to this conflict. We are, uh, we, we are followers of uh, Jesus's teachings uh, that blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, we are followers of the call for making peace and we, our good offices are available for peace. Now, one thing I also believe uh, that the Pope uh, does do and will continue to do is uh, bring together the world religious leaders in this calling, because I think this is extremely important as well. And I believe that this is likely to happen. So yes, I believe that the Vatican is a wonderful place to have an informal uh, discussion about these things, to bring people together, to use the Pope's methodology of encounter, which is actually uh, not only at the uh, kind of conceptual level, but the Pope also has a a wonderful uh, Jesuit methodology of how you get the very disparate views around the room to be heard uh, in a uh, in a way that is constructive. And I I think that those methods could actually work right now because it's true these sides don't even have they don't seem to even have the mechanics of talking to each other. And mm -hmm. this is completely deadly. Yeah. Well, we appreciate this conversation. There are all sorts of people in Russia, Ukraine, and in the West who wish that this war could come to an end. And uh, some of them are in the same church or the same uh, sort of idea about uh, humanity's future, but they can't seem to find a location where they can come together propose something and have a kind of peace option or peace movement emerge as a real opportunity. So the fact that you are talking about it is great. We appreciate you very much. The fact that the Vatican may continue its efforts and possibly they'll bear some fruit is a hope that we have. I think, th I think the efforts will bear fruit. And I will say one thing, I'm hoping the war ends in 2024, but I also want to recall that next year is a jubilee year that's a great time for real peace to be <laughs> to uh, bloom everywhere. So we should look forward to a jubilee year as well.